Hello from Blue Willow Bookshop in Houston, Texas. Oh, this day makes me so happy. Any day it's an Alexis Hall day is a great day. My name is Kathy Berner. I'm the event coordinator at Blue Willow Bookshop, and we are honored to host this virtual event celebrating Alexis's new book, Paris Delancourt is About to Crumble, which was released earlier this month. I am so glad to see some familiar names in the chat and to welcome all of you here. I will just tell you that uh, before we went live, I was telling Alexis and his fabulous assistant, Mary, that he has the kindest fans. We absolutely adore being in communication with you and are so glad to celebrate you and Alexis today. So that's enough for now. Please join me in welcoming the absolutely fabulous Alexis Hall to the event. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. How are you? I am okay. Yes, I always like, even though I know you just clicked a little button that says mute on it, I'm always like, what if I've done the wrong thing? But I think I'm all right. <laughs> you are all right. Sound good. This is all good. I'm just, I know I say it every time. I'm just so happy to hear your voice and to get to spend some time with you. Oh, that's very kind of you. It's, it's just a joy. Um, and on behalf of your fans, I want to thank you for your productivity that led to four books this year. Oh, don't. It's, it's genuinely, as I will always say, it is a thank you for your kindness. Thank you. Thank you for thanking me. It's not sustainable. Please don't try and emulate it. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I mean, I can only imagine because you have to balance, I mean, any cr person engaging in a creative endeavor has to balance so many things, but by having four books... Yeah, it was, it's been very tight. Like it's, I would, I would not recommend it. Um, Do not I, I recommend. Hope, I hope you will have enjoyed them, but it, it's, it's a consequence of rapidly shifting circumstances, not a, not a policy decision. So, looking to twenty twenty three, there's three on the docket for the first half. Oh, possibly. I know. Mean, I I lose track of like what 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 are you counting? You have, the first I have half? I have Glitterland in January. Ah, oh, yes, that's a, that's a, that's that's the re-release. So it's been slightly that, like there there is stuff the Glitterland thing, uh, but there's that that is in a different box in my head. Yeah. So yeah. and and friends, so Glitterland is in January. We have an event already on the books. It will go live after this event. Um. And I will send that link in the email that I send y'all. And we also got the pre-order details that Alexis will announce very soon. Great. Oh, look, Caroline's already posted it. So, okay, so that's Glitterland in January. Then Something Spectacular is in April. I believe that's right, yes. I, I, I it is. shift around so much. I know, it, it, and these all might change, but I did, I did check, um, I did check, Ingram, which is the, the main distributor in the U.S., yeah. so they list all the release dates. And then in June, and then in June mm -hmm. is Mortal Follies. That is correct, yes. Uh, oh, I'm so excited for all of them, but that one. So do you know of anything else that's coming up in the second half of the year? Um, so I believe uh, 10 Things Never Happened, which is the uh, the first spin-off within the uh, the sort of the, the wider setting of the boyfriend material universe which i think we're now in house trying to as the material world for obvious <laughs> folk reasons um uh yeah in my head i think it's like so for a while it's called the amnesia plot i might have talked about it that sometimes it's you did. in my head sometimes it's called the amnesia plot the amnesia book but all 10 things never happened or 10 things uh is i think end of the year again again i lose track but i think i think it's just three books in a re-release is um Oh, just three books in a re-release. Yeah, it is. Uh, is uh, well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's one less than this year. It's slowly getting to a, yeah. getting to a thing. I think, but I I'm, think that's I'm, all of it. <laughs> I'm so, but I'm also so excited for people who haven't let, read Glitterland to get to read this gorgeous new edition with all the um, additional things they're bringing in and that beautiful cover man Elizabeth yeah, is no, so talented really nice it's, I think the other thing, no, I'm, I'm very excited for, for that to get to a new audience I think the other thing I'm sort of weirdly excited about and I like to mention because I think it's very very important is that the new edition of land amongst other things will actually be available to libraries to get hold of in a useful way again if people are worried about your bank balance next year please do remember that libraries exist and need your support and are important places that do wonderful work um like you know um, i say do just for obviously as long as i was already using it here by both using it and also you know write to your local people and tell them not to shut the damn things down um because you know 
Amen. There, there are soft targets and there's culture war bullshit. <laughs> yes. And, and, and as I, I see some people are saying they love their libraries, I, some I see some people saying they're librarians. I too am a librarian turned bookseller. So yes, I'm so happy that a physical <laughs> copy. I'm so sorry. I, uh, that's a, that's a, I'm sure that's a wonderful career trajectory. But that does mean that in a sense, you went from providing a public service to just doing the same thing, but for money. <laughs> And you know what? I like putting books in people's hands, however yeah. I can do it. It's all about that. Um, but yeah, it it is what it is. But to, for people to be able to check out a hard copy of the, of Glitterland from the library is just a wonderful, wonderful yeah, thing. No, really I'm, I'm super excited. So I'm just throwing this out there. And I know you have a lot on your plate. There's so much on your plate. But Gay Bought by the Billionaire wouldn't oh. kill me to see another chapter, friend. It's on the it's it, it's on the docket. Um, there's so much to juggle at the moment. I know. Um, and like, <laughs> it uh, I will I will come back to it. It's just a question of um. I know of time, and I get it, but I'm just telling you, there is, there is absolutely there is, yeah. an interest in it. There is, yeah. <laughs> I'm. It's definitely a thing I'll come back to. It's just the sheer like, oh, I say like four books this year, three books next year, plus re-release, plus ah, oh, and and the other difficult thing about like about writing is there's so much peripheral stuff that's not the writing that's like it's yeah, absolutely it's a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, so you take all the time you need, but that would be great to ever to read more of it because I do reread that. It oh, makes perfect. me very happy. Um, so I want to turn to the world of the Bake Expectation series. And uh -huh. here's my great segue. I made Bernard's biscuits. Woo! And they're very tasty. Oh, I'm glad. Um, I will try to endeavor not to chew them in your ear, y'all. Um, so I love this world. It's so much fun. And as someone who is a fan of both versions of Bake Off that were on, that have, that were on, TV and are on TV and mm -hmm. as well as is this series, I just get all the great, get all the great vibes from it. So can you tell us a little bit, everyone here has probably read Paris, so I'm not going to ask you to talk about Paris, but can you talk about, because you mentioned at the end of the book, Grace Forsyth, Marianne Wolvercoat, Wilfred Honey, Colin Thrimp, and Jennifer Hallett will return on the next season in 2024. Yes. Uh, so, as always, everything is subject to change. Everything is up in the air. Currently, the plan for the next book is uh, that it is to be entitled Audrey Lane's Story. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've pissed that up already. To be entitled Audrey Lane Stirs the Pot. Um, and it's going to be another title. Uh, another title. Another same setup, basically. So, it's a season of the show. Um, it will only be set one year later, even though there's a two year publication gap. Um, and it's going to be about a journalist who works for a small local newspaper uh, who goes on the show and forms a relationship with um, the show's oldest ever contestant. By relationship, I mean non-romantic relationship with the show's oldest ever contestant and like kind of works through her story because she's a journalist um, while also kind of developing a thing with Jennifer maybe um so that's where that's going um it's all very much in the preliminary stages because it's not due out for a while and there's three other books coming in the middle and so like because <laughs> oh, the whole like mind shift switch of like because obviously I'm now in the talking about baking books thing I'm just been today working on 10 things and like it's, it's just, everything's going at once so my head's very fuzzy at the moment but that's that's the idea i'm so excited and i don't know if you can see the chat but people are losing their mind over potential jennifer oh good i just she's so foul-mouthed and just gets so abrupt and brusque but man i just think she's hilarious and i adore her and i cannot wait it if the book ends up going that way I cannot wait to see more of her. Fantastic. That would just be fantastic. Okay, so speaking of Paris Delancourt is about to crumble. I love these characters so much, Alexis. Oh, thank you. I just, they're, <laughs> that is one of the, the real joys of your work is these beautifully well-developed characters with incredible banter. I, I mean, 
Paris, Tarek, Tarek's whole family, Morag, all the contestants. And it's so, so I just finished watching, and I know you don't watch the current Bake Off, but I just watched the final last night. And it's so funny thinking about previous series as, and also your characters. And now I mm -hmm. kind of think that your characters are former characters from the Bake Off, even though they're not. <laughs> it's, I mean, so there's a, um, like, there's a meme that occasionally goes around of like the 10 characters who are on Bake Off, because it's kind of the same every year. And that is very, very consciously something the books play into. Um, yeah, there, there are, but it was just, it, it's just, it's so much fun because I really feel like I watched another season when I read Paris. That is very much what I'm going for. Well, you nailed it on the head. It was fantastic. fantastic. One of the things, and I don't think this is too spoilery. Oh my God, the toxic social media culture. Oh yeah. Did these, did none of these people learn if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all? <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's part, part of what the book is about, obviously, is how Paris copes with suddenly being in the public eye. Um, it's, I think, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to do with the book was, to, I, I think the first thing I would say is, like, one of the things that I was a little bit concerned about with the book is that, like, people who are in the public eye doing things about how social media is bad I always feel a little bit so-so about because it's always because like, it it always feels a bit self-serving. But yes. I did want because it's a, because the premise is that it's set on a reality TV show. Um, it's um, I did want to engage with that aspect of it because actually one of the things that if you follow Bake Off or you know, hashtag other not hashtag like you know, footnote other cooking based reality TV shows are available um, is the like it's not. It's not all good. And actually, contestants do sometimes get treated like absolute fucking shit. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, just, uh... Yeah, no, um, there's a, there were a couple of the, um, there were a couple of the, from the toxic social media bits, there were a couple of the tweets that I would occasionally get like notes back from editors kind of saying, is this a bit extreme? Is this going a bit too far? And a lot of the time I would kind of come back and kind of say, are you really saying that this isn't the kind of thing someone would say to someone's face on Twitter? I mean, it it absolutely is. Um, I I mean, and I just it it disheartens me so much, but it also is reality, and I appreciate. <laughs> it, but I appreciate well, that you maybe balance. Maybe not much longer. Thanks for thanks for Elon Musk. But... <laughs> <laughs> Good lord, let's lock people in the garage. Anyway. Um, we're not going down that rabbit hole, Alexis. <laughs> Fair we enough. Are not. Oh, it's, uh, it's, but it's... we're not going there. No, fine. Sorry. It's but no, it is just like why would you anyway? Yeah. I can't possibly understand why someone would do that. But also I very much appreciate I think I would use the word deft here, how deftly you handled both Tarek and Paris's mental health experiences mm -hmm. during the show. Um, it, I don't know that I've seen read. I mean, I probably have, but I, since I've read this frequently and so recently, to mm -hmm. see the interior, the, the interior of mm -hmm. Paris's experiences before the diagnosis. Yeah, I thought was so effective and well done. Was that a conscious decision to do that? I mean, pretty much, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Very short, simple answer. Yeah, but that was the entirely the idea um, was to get like what's going on in his head before you get um, before you get a sort of a clear sort of medicalized description of what's going on with him. Um, I it's I should stress I don't think that's something that's unique. I think there are other things that have done that. I mean, you could argue that that's kind of what Crazy Ex Girlfriend did on TV with um, uh, with borderline personality disorder. It's um, but yeah, that was very much a conscious choice to have you in his head before you get a confirmation of what's going on with him. And I just thought that was so effective and also so important is not the right word, but I'm going to use it because my brain's not firing correctly. Um, for us as the reader to see that experience, because mm -hmm. if we don't have that, I mean, it, it's again, it's the mirrors in the windows. You're allowing yeah. someone with that experience to feel very seen. Yeah. 
And you're also allowing those who don't have that experience or maybe have loved ones with that experience to see what it's like inside their head. And that was so, so valuable to valuable. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. It's, um, it's one of those things where I always like to stick a, I, you know, I like to stick footnotes on things. I always like to stick a footnote on things and say, as always, not everyone's experience is going to be the same. One of the things I find really, one of the things I find very challenging about reactions to my work, the way that like kind of, um, because I do tend to write about things that you say, like make people, make some people feel seen, make some people feel this has given them insight into other people in their lives. That's great. I think it's important to recognize that there are people, there are people who will read this book and be like, that is not what it's like. What the fuck are you doing? Um, and it's important to recognize that those people's perceptions, experiences, understandings are valid. But I think that nevertheless, I do hope it has value for people who feel spoken to it by it, feel seen by it, or feel that it helps them understand other people in their lives. I think particularly, particularly when you go down the like, there are people in my life route, I think you have to tread a little bit more carefully because, you know, please don't learn what it's like to be someone who's not you from a book I wrote that right. that person doesn't necessarily identify with. Like, that becomes a lot more complex. Um, it, it absolutely does, but it, and it might not be the same. Yeah. It might not even resemble it, but it is an experience that is not your own that yeah. can be challenging for someone. And to see that, I think, is very valuable. I think having, um, I think, I, th I think the general, what's the word, as, as an empathy exercise in general, I think there's always a value to that in fiction, even if it's, even if it doesn't necessarily map exactly to what individual people in your individual life might feel their experiences are like I think yes I think you're right that just being confronted with something you maybe haven't thought about haven't experienced even you know, no matter how it's handled in some ways can be a, a useful empathy exercise I think you're right and I think I think visibility matters yeah um okay we're gonna try something friends and I'm shifting to a little bit we're, we're shifting to a little more levity than important serious conversations caroline i don't know how this works but we're going to try a poll on on the <laughs> webinar we're going to see how this works caroline is releasing the poll caroline hopefully and then poll should i don't know just poll oh, okay yeah, yep. oh, there some, it goes uh... it's live so the poll is there um oh, am i uh, should i vote on this one? Oh no apparently I, host it, panelists can't no vote, so but holy cow this is so cool this is so weird like, i know gonna... So anyway, we're trying to do lemon shortbread and vanilla shortbread count as two different types of biscuits, single choice, yes, no, or what is a biscuit? Y'all are participating very actively. Look at this. I see. No, it's interesting. I'm not, so I'm not seeing people's answers. Okay, I also, so I clicked I think... on poll. I clicked oh, on how... poll. If you go I... to more, if you look along the bottom. Oh, more. Do you see more? And I then you can click more. on poll. Okay. I will say, if I click the wrong button and disconnect, I'm really sorry. It's not. You'll come back in. It'll be fine. Let's yeah. just practice. No, I've got, because I've got the, I think I've got the poll popped up, but I can't. Yeah, but oh, I maybe can't it's just me. It I'm a panelist. Oh. I think you're, I think because you're a host. This is, okay. Sorry, this is behind the scenes nonsense that is not relevant at all, but. We apologize, people. Well, I think the I'm the only one. Who, <laughs> sorry. A, yeah. Okay, so. That's why we sit in dead silence while the poll happened. Exactly. So the poll happened. And uh, the question is, do lemon shortbread and vanilla shortbread count as two different kinds of biscuits? 64% of people said yes. 32% said no. And 4% said what's a biscuit? I mean, fair. I just... Interesting. We were discussing this. So the oh. End poll. Okay, thank you, Monique. I'm ending the poll. Now I'm going to show the share the results. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's cute. Okay, uh, I don't know. That was that was really fun to see y'all do it. Feels like the end um, of a chapter of a Telltale game. <laughs> exactly. If Bernard says they're different, then they're different. That's fair. Um. So anyway, that was just kind of fun. Thank you for doing that with us. <laughs> one other one other point of levity, please use in the chat, and it's going to go by very quickly. But favorite '80s movie. Y'all drop that into the chat. And Alexis, tell us some of your favorite 80s movies while oh, you eat I, one of Bernard's biscuits. I will, I will, I will say that my like, I'll say two things about favorite 80s movies. The first of which is that in my head, 80s and 90s really blur together. And the second is that like kind of oh god, someone's mentioned Princess Bride. If Princess Bride is 80s, then definitely Princess Bride. Um but like so many things from the 80s, I I've re <laughs> 
you go back to them and you're like, oh my god, this has a lot more sexual assault in it than I remember it having. Yes. You know? Yeah. The, many movies from the 80s did not age well. Oh, yeah, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry, just looking at all the things that people have, like, kind of, that people are mentioning, and, like, you just, particularly the ones you look at, and you're like, kind of, oh, God, yeah, that's technically, like, it's kind of technically, yeah, Return of the Jedi is an 80s movie. Um, yeah. Uh, no, Princess I, Bride was 87. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, these are hilarious. I love all I, these answers. Yeah, respect for Brazil as well. But, um, yeah, as someone yeah. from the northern central part of the U.S., Ferris Bueller was very big for me, but Paris, yeah. but um, Princess Bride slays everything yeah that was that was amazing okay that was fun thank you everybody so i'm gonna try and sh- okay i'm gonna try and close this poll again if i actually just next no i'm fine i'm good yeah, I okay it. so i have i have a comment more than a question here one of the things i really love about your books is how in the timeline of the book you would expect a, a, a reader to a to, to a generic book would expect a certain event to happen at a certain point and then have a denouement. Mm-hmm. But you move it. Yeah. You have them take place in different parts of the story. So then the denouement is, I'm probably not using that word right, but the, the aftermath is longer and more meaningful to me. And I'm thinking specifically Lady for a Duke mm-hmm. um, with Viola and Gracewood. I would yeah. have if I was just randomly picking that book up, not but and it was not written by you, I would have expected the revelation to come at about the ninety percent point. Yeah, and you stuck it at about the forty percent point. Yeah, and that made I was thinking about that today. That made that glorious epilogue so much more joyful. Mm-hmm. So obviously, that's a conscious decision. Yes. Ah uh, yes. Do you do that all like when you're when you're plotting? Do you th- are you thinking? Okay, so how well, can so I move it, things around? So, okay, so let me back up slightly. So when you say it's so obviously it is a conscious decision to put things in the place they happen in. It's not explicitly a conscious decision to put things in places that aren't the places they'd normally be. I think that would be a little. I think that would feel slightly gimmicky. Um, it's so, um, so particularly so, so, um, so Lady for Duke, the I mean, that's very straightforward, which is that, like, you when you're when you are writing a romance with a trans heroine, you don't want the reader to be spending 90% of the book being like, When's she gonna get outed? That would be awful. So, that kind of that kind of had to come early, um, and sometimes it's just because I, I don't consider myself a quote unquote pantser. I think I've, I often say that I'm not a big fan of the, the plotter versus pantser framing, but because I often things do come together as they go, I will sometimes find that just, you know, big moments of emotional conflict just feel like they fall naturally earlier or later than, um, than you might expect. Um, Either because just because because when you're writing about relationships between people, people are different, and some people go to places very fast, some people go to them very later, very late, very 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 later. That's not a phrase. But very they fast, very late. Yeah, yeah. I I just I appreciate that, and and you do things differently in some of your books. That I might not have expected. And because you are so skilled, sorry, fact, you cannot discount that. Because you are so skilled at this, I never know quite what I'm going to get. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate that. The, by the way, and now I'm going to move to some pre submitted questions. And people were kind in these things and saying nice things. And so, mm-hmm. friends, what I do is I share with Alexis the pre-submitted questions and he and I kind of map out what we're going to try to hit and then we always know that we're going to have additional questions in the Q&A so we try to move over to that but Alexis people were nice in this people think you do good work no that's very kind of them (laughs) okay so here's a question from Maria 
do you feel your writing is changing as you're getting older, as the world is shifting? And is there a point in when you'd consider writing characters who are middle-aged or older, or do you think that's harder to make a romance believable? I says there's a... As I think, you know, we've done a lot of these now, my response to... Um, my response to so many questions is, oh, there's a lot of things in that. Um, I think and I think I think everyone's writing changes as time passes. I think I don't know to what extent part of that's being older and part of it's just it's not being 2010 anymore. Um, in terms of specifically of writing about older characters, that's complex. Um, part of that becomes a I really like there are really strong reasons why last exceptional prejudice framing is bad because um because there are loads of types of prejudice you can basically get away with fine in the right context but i do think it is notable that often not always but often publishers are more willing still to express skepticism about say older protagonists than they are about um protagonists from demographics they might have been more willing to express skepticism about say five or ten years ago if you see what i mean mm -hmm. like these days it is mostly kind of taboo to say books about group x don't sell but it kind of isn't if group x is people over 30. um i the other there's a I always say these things have multiple parts and um the other part that's complex here is something i'm increasingly aware of as something i think i've become increasingly aware of as i've got older um is the a lot of the time age is an illusion in books anyway like um it's uh it's something i've taken to referring to as the uh, non-specific 20s which is that actually an awful lot of book characters, particularly contemporary book characters, obviously different in historicals, um, tend to like officially they're either 26 or 28, almost always an even numbered age. Um, they kind of act like they're about 23 or 24 because they have to be a bit reckless for the plot to happen and they have resources like they're 47. Um, <laughs> something I've also got really used to or so I got really aware hyper aware well particularly because I'm actually very much so with um with Paris because that's a book about people who are like university age um I think the last um I think the last question in the the FAQ is how old does it make you feel that these characters were born after 9-11 so <laughs> old that's the yeah. answer so old um is you suddenly get hyper aware of the fact that a lot of the time when you are a proper grown up, sorry, I don't mean that, yet. when you are my age, writing about people in their 20s, like suddenly you, you project your experience of being 20 onto those people, even though it's probably not what their experience of being 20 would have been like. And then you suddenly have this mind blowing revelation where you're like, hang on a second, all the books I read about 20 year olds when I was 20 were written by people in their 40s and 50s and projected their experiences of being 20. So you've got this weird thing. Uh, I think I've mentioned this in other, um, in other interviews, but it's like you do get this weird thing where you suddenly realize that every every generation learns what it's like to be young from people 20 or 30 years older pretending to be writing about them, but they're really writing about themselves 30 years earlier, um, which is complex. Um, it is, and that's a great answer. I love that so much. Thank you. Um, here's a quick one from Hannah. If Luke says Roger Moore is the fourth best Bond, then who are the three better and in what order? Uh, so, uh, one of the, th one of the sort of running gags, I think in, um, in the material world is that Luke is a bit basic. Um, and if you Google for like best Bonds list, or if you just ask like people that don't particularly give it much thought the best bonds are almost always in order either sean connery or daniel craig usually sean connery for the nostalgia 
then Pierce Brosnan, then Roger Moore, then kind of all the others. I actually quite like Timothy Dalton. Um, but like, it's, it's this sort of, sort of old thing about the Bonds is that um, they form a kind of a weirdly accepted hierarchy in like, you know that where the internet sometimes forms consent, consensuses, consensies, consensi. It's consensus is, I think, the correct answer, but I really like non standard pluralizations. Yes, Consen you do. <laughs> Consensus. Um, yeah. Um, here's one that I love from Eros. Is there any story from Greek mythology that you think would be fun to do a retelling of? One that's already queer or perfect for a queer, re queer reimagining and might we see something like this in your upcoming book, Mortal Follies? Oh, thank you for the plug. Um, uh, <laughs> indeed, Mortal Follies coming, I think, June next year. Um, I spent ages thinking about this question because I think the answer might be literally every single queer retelling of a Greek myth you can possibly imagine has been done. Um, uh, so, uh, and, uh, well, I think the other thing I'll say to to do the thing I always do that I hope you enjoy where I weigh everything, where I weigh everything the question. One of the things that's really difficult with like queerness and any culture before 200 years ago really is I think it's a mistake to surrender the cultural attitudes of those eras to modern heteronormative notions, if you see what I mean. Like um, a, a version of okay. Achilles and Patroclos where Achilles is banging Patroclos. That's not a queer retelling. That's just the story. Um, weirdly, a version, a version of Achilles and Patroclos where Patroclos tops, that would be a queer retelling because that would be a contravention of my understanding, at least, of ancient Greek sexual norms um okay yeah like it's complicated um the the one that i did the, the one that did hit me today that again i goes on my go, i've got a massive massive oh this would be cool to do in 20 years when i've got a three minute list is um it's almost certainly been done but i think i'd like to do um like lesbian persephone and eurydice so you do Orpheus mm. and Eurydice, but like Eurydice meets Persephone while Persephone's up in the world. Um, and they kind of run off the underworld together and Orpheus comes back after, goes back after her. Um, possibly you then ship Orpheus Hades. Um, like that, I think that would be really cool. I think it would possibly work as a, uh, it might really work as a YA, um, but I might, be, I might just be thinking about what YA was like when I was like, paying more attention to it a long time ago but like see, I, I mean I, I think teenagers still love death I think <laughs> they do um wow I mean, Alexis I'm, I mean I would say I'm sure it's been done um and <laughs> although now someone will, someone will do it and then someone will be like I think I've got actually Alexis Moore mentioned this on a but that's not that's not how ideas work someone else has, someone someone if either it's been done or someone's writing that book right now um and I'll get very very successful with it and I'll get very very jealous um i think that's a fascinating fascinating concept and i vote that that happens uh, from you listening to this interview dm me yeah absolutely <laughs> or probably um, my agent thinking about it i think that's how do, it works so do you do you want to say the anything about oh, mortal follies yes i'm so sorry i went, went off no, on don't apologize technology. because that was a great digression um so Mortal Follies is, uh, so the world, it's not exactly a Greek myth retelling thing exactly. It's like the the core inspiration is that thing you get, uh, uh, saying stuff is inspired by Shakespeare makes you sound like a complete prick, but it's the specific thing you get in Shakespeare where, because it's from the past when people were superstitious. Um, and also I think, sorry, I'm digressing again. And also I think because it's, very specifically from the era just after the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, when we didn't really, like, my understanding is that we had this weird thing where we were looking at, like, all of our culture going, but all of this comes from the Catholic Church, and we don't like the Catholic Church anymore. What have we got? Shit, let's go for Romans. Um, so, like, because a lot of Shakespeare just takes for granted that classical gods, like, exist. Um, and so, and very specifically, you've then got, like, 
um, Midsummer Night's Dream that takes for granted that fairies and classical gods exist at the same time, and it's set in ancient Greece. Um, Mortal Follies is not set in ancient Greece, it's set in Regency England, but it's set in a version of Regency England where classical deities just kind of exist and everyone just kind of rolls with it. Um, so it's it's mostly me riffing on that. Um, so it's yeah, it's um the pitch the pitch I've now started going with. I, I probably talked to you about what I'm, what I'm allowed to compare things to and what I'm not because I'm um, like people get upset if you compare this too much. Is that it's now it's for people that watched Bridgerton and House of the Dragon. I think is the the way to put it. Well, and I think I also heard you say queer magical Bridgerton. Queer, queer magical Bridgerton is the other way to do it. Yes, yeah, and it's anyway. I'm very excited for it. I I'm hoping people will enjoy it. Cannot wait to see what the covers treatment's going to be. Like, I cannot wait to see what the cover is going to look like. Uh, we're looking at that right now. I hope you enjoy that too. I can't say too much. Well, I know you can't say too much, but I have very high hopes for that. Um, okay, here are here's a question about this is hilarious about London Calling from Chris. Miffy in the London Calling books is the daughter of the Earl of Coombe Camden, and Alan Pope in the Winter Bakes All series did some design work for Coombe Camden Manor. If no Alan encountered Miffy and or Alex, what would they all make of each other? I think they'd get on really well, weirdly, which I know is difficult because everyone hates Alan and everyone loves Alex, but one of the things that I keep again obsessively over reflecting on because of the way my brain works is that like I, yeah I, I, Alex is an archetypal problematic fave like he's, he's he is a Tory he is landed aristocracy like he hangs out with the racist high court judge um and it's like they're very specifically not set in the same world like um uh, because they're different publishers different things but there was that just one name crossover um and yeah Alex loves posh people because he's an odious social climber so, Sorry, Alan loves possible because he's an odious social climber. And they've got the same names beginning the same letter. This is why you never give characters names that are given the same letter. And Alex loves everybody because he's just kind of that kind of person. And neither one is going to think about the ways in which the other one is problematic. So yeah, they get along like a house on fire. I think you're right. Um, here's some questions uh, from Paris. Uh, Erica says, Harry Dobson also struggles with anxiety. Yes. Was there something about writing Harry that made you want to explore anxiety in greater depth with Paris? Um, I think it's just that I was kind of, I think because not it wasn't about Harry specifically. It was about the, I think it was about the reality TV format in that okay. I feel like if you're going to write something that's on reality TV, you have to deal with the fact that being on reality TV is stressful. And um I wear, so I think I wound up sort of unconsciously building quite a strong this is about anxiety theme into the into the books because a lot of it's about how people deal with this very exposed, very high pressure situation. But they are like they're doing quite different things with it. Like I think the thing the thing that was really important to me with Harry and something I've had some very lovely feedback on from some people who feel it's both of them is that one of the problems with mental health stuff is that and this is you get this mental health stuff, you get this LGBTQ stuff, you get this a lot of things, which is that it is it is often seen as the preserve of the middle classes. Um, and there is this kind of notion that working class people are often portrayed as either somehow lacking the psychological interiority to have that, or there's this, there's this really complicated, like, um, denigrating discourse, where it's because, because for good reason, like um like talking about class stuff is important sometimes people will use the accusation that a particular thing is like a middle class thing or you actually get it's called, well, you get it as a white person thing as well um like 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 you particularly within lgbtq culture you often wind up with for example people of color who are also non-binary tend to like kind of sometimes get people being all like oh no that's just a white person thing and like that gets really complicated in the same way with mental health stuff you do kind of get this like oh it's a middle class person thing oh it's just white people complaining which is difficult for people who are not middle class white people who suffer with that kind of thing so what I wanted to do with Harry was to explore some of the ways that can manifest in someone who is otherwise a very straightforward working class lad, whereas, um, like, but it's more of a, more of a sub theme, whereas obviously Paris is 
story is very strongly about that because it's from Paris's point of view, it's in Paris's head and Paris handles being on TV very differently from the way Harry, Harry does um, for yeah, a variety of reasons. Um, mm-hmm. Partly due to having less of a support network because obviously like, you know, Harry's got his mates and his family around him. Um, partly because Harry's not the kind of person people do. Maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm making incorrect assumptions there, but I think like there are certain pe- types of people that social media love to hate, particularly the kind of people that appear on like on that kind of show and the the talented insecure one is the kind of person people love to hate in um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, for different reasons <laughs> the muslim one is the kind of person certain people love to hate people very seldom love to hate the good looking working class man um just because it i i there's no cachet in that and it doesn't like I, I for whatever reason i don't know like it's it's a thing about social media so as a result Harry has a different yeah. experience. So, of course, also the other thing is that um, in the first book, you don't get the aftermath. You don't get what happens when the show airs, and suddenly, right, you're dealing with it being on TV. But even if even if that had been in the book, I think Harry would have dealt with it fine. Like you know, he's got his mm-hmm. friends, he's got his family. He and Rosalind are together at that point. I think you're right. right. Whereas Paris is in a really messed up place, and so it's uh, and so it becomes a much bigger deal in Harry in Paris's life. But yeah. Yeah. In both cases, it's always about exploring the same theme from different perspectives, which is a thing you can do in books. Amazing. I know. Yeah. So, Erica asked another question that is a perfect follow up to this. Some of the funniest lines and some of the most heartbreaking lines are Paris's own thoughts when he is Mm -hmm. an anxious mess. Yeah. Was it difficult to strike the right balance there? Um, I think striking a balance questions are always difficult, um, partly because right. whenever someone says, was it, was it difficult to strike the right balance? My first response is always, you know, be aware not everyone is going to believe I did strike the right balance. The, balance, the right balance is going to be in a different place with different people. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to get the balance right. It bounced through kind of, you know, editors and editing processes and people being a bit like, oh, I think this is a bit too extreme. I think this is a bit too, like, um, this is a bit too hard to read. Um, this is a bit too flippant. Um, it was something I thought about. Um, it's it's really questions of the form. How hard was it to get the balance right? Really difficult because you can never know that you have. And so it's always about it's always about the same level of hardness, which is you kind of do your best and hope it works. That's fair. Here's one from Monica. Um, all of your characters have such incredible style and fashion sense that really helps depict their personality do you do fashion research was there any and was there any specific celebrity or person who was the inspiration for Tarek's amazing style um I think one of the things I often say is I don't like talking about doing research I mean like when when it's stuff like fashion fair enough um because that's something you actually can research but Mm -hmm. um but I tend to just think of it as being aware of stuff. Uh, yeah, so like I um I sometimes pay attention to fashion YouTubers. Like there are, or there are like you, there are people who do like there are people who often there are quite a few people who do fashion focused breakdowns of pop culture stuff, um, which is really useful as someone who creates pop culture stuff and wants to think about what fashion is saying about people. Um, sometimes I will just like. Google for like what so some of it some of it's like just what's for sale in particular kinds of shop, particularly if it's because with with style with with personal style and fashion, you have people that like, so Tariq actually pays attention to fashion and has a personal style. Um Paris just goes to expensive shops and buys clothes that don't fit, but you still need to think like kind of okay, what's for sale in those shops? Um in terms of uh in terms, in terms of Tariq's personal style, um, like you, you kind of can't write a um, uh, a fashion forward South Asian guy without at least having a nod to Tan France because um, he's amazing. Um, on the other hand, he's a different generation, so they don't don't actually have a styles that overlap that much. But you have to keep one eye on him. Um, weirdly, um, like I tried to give him a little bit of the like you know like early Harry Styles, like um, uh, like kind of like just end end of in one direction a little bit post mm-hmm. one direction mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. kind of that era Harry Styles before he went kind of like so before he'd gone into like full gender bending and yeah. into but when he was just that kind of not necessarily constrained by conventional masculinity but still kind of chic and quirky mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so just for those listening at home I will I will start using Tariq but I have a Tarek in my life yeah. I so will, I, I will say um I you know, I'm a white British person, so I do. And if if there is a Tarek in your life, please stick with Tarek. Okay. Um, I'm. I just want to acknowledge that there's another yeah. pronunciation. It's, I mean, it's I. I am not an authority on the pro- authority. <laughs> I am not an authority on the pronunciation of South Asian names. Uh, I may well be saying it wrong, in which case I sincerely apologise. It is all good. Don't. Yeah. Okay. So. I just so everybody knows we're about to move to spoilers. Okay. Oh, oh. that's a great question. I didn't see who asked it. <laughs> Christopher. Okay, I've been practicing saying that word all day and I can't I am embarrassed about how I do it. So I would like to hear I mean you so say it, Paris's cat's name. So again, uh, I am uh, not an authority on South Asian names. I'm definitely not an authority on ancient Egyptian names. I would say Nefenefruaten. Okay, um, that's kind of what I was doing. But um, I uh, like, and that becomes really complicated because that's like a language that has had to be reconstructed from like a bunch of other sources and things. There's, there's loads of really interesting things about how we make our best guesses about how those kind of languages are pronounced. But um, yeah, absolutely, and I agree. The audiobook is a fabulous reference. Yeah. Um, before we move to spoilers, before we move to spoilers, I'm going to do one funny question from Adelaide. Well, I think it's funny. Uh, what is the correct way to eat French toast in husband material? It was both breakfast in bed and portable in the car food. I think you can eat it however you like. Um, I will say in bed you can have a plate. In the car, I think in in my head it's from Tupperware in the car okay that was mine um, too <laughs> yeah um I personally don't like it. it's like so so syrupy that it's dripping and so it's not as messy as it might appear but also you can hold a plate under your chin exactly and so what I would do is I would like cut it almost into fingers and then have a syrup like have a little container of syrup so I could dip. You have a little dip yeah that's, that's, that, that's, that's how I would do it <laughs> okay Friends, we are moving into spoilers. So if you want to ask, add spoilers to the Q&A, I do have a couple spoilers, but then I am happy to move to other people's comments. Um, Paris's parents. Yep. I'm a- For the love of all that's holy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm... I Has very much appreciate- out gone to their interest? Yes. Exactly. Because we're just getting some comments from people who seem to be saying, I'm leaving now. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. 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 No, that's why I don't want to, like, kind of. Um, uh, yeah. So you're stalling. You're stalling. Okay. Yeah, so stalling parents- you. yeah, goodbye, everybody who's going. Let's give everyone a couple of seconds. To sorry. Go. Sorry. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's completely fine. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, that we were actually providing spoiler space for the spoilers. I, otherwise, and I did. And I didn't say anything specific. So. Yeah. I think we're all right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Mean, uh, they're going to be wondering now what's going on with Paris's parents. Be well, like, now they can read of, quickly um, and get to the end. <laughs> Like it, it turns out they're aliens. It's all very exciting. Exactly. Um, there's, there's a whole twist at the end. It becomes an action movie. Yeah, his his okay. Okay, so assume, I think parents. Going, I think people are, are gone. Are we going to say okay? After this, it's your problem if you are still around. Just like exactly. take your headphones off, shut your eyes. Cool. I, I mean, you know, in so many uh, films and books, there's mm-hmm. a reconciliation. But they don't even ever respond. Yeah, no, I, I like. I don't want to say I don't do reconciliations, but I, 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 um, I th- at least a couple of my books have been quite notable for not having reconciliations where you might expect a reconciliation. Um, like I think it's a complex one. Like, um, I, I, I think there's there's a bunch of questions I think they think from the from the submissions about kind of the the bad parents themes in my work and um yeah the thing that's difficult I think one of the things that I think makes I think ironically part of what makes like Paris's parents super hateable is that they aren't there so there's nothing to humanize them at all um right like, yes I, I 
I kind of like to, I like one of the one of the things I try to avoid, and again, it is up to readers whether they feel I've avoided it or not, is doing kind of the, the literary equivalent. We've got a term for this now, thanks to the internet. We, I try to avoid doing the literary equivalent of inventing a guy then getting mad at him, if you see what I mean. Um, yes. And even with Paris's parents, like, I don't think, I don't, uh, again, I'm a strong believer in the death of the author. I don't have a strong policy on whose parents are the worst or which parents are the worst parents or which parents are the worst parents. I don't necessarily think Paris's parents were more harmful to Paris than Rosalind's parents were to Rosalind or, or Oliver's parents were to Oliver. Um, Very I think, fair. I think you get less, or for that matter, you know, um, uh, than, than John Fleming was to Luke. It's, um, it's more difficult with Paris's parents because they're just literally not in it. And so you get like these little fragmentary bits of Paris's memories that are sort of obviously deliberately designed to be a bit heartbreaking. Um, but, um, but in my, I don't think I, I don't I, like, they've not, it's not like they've got a sympathetic backstory. It's not like they kind of, they were, they actually began, you know, no! had to go into witness protection or anything, but I do, I do feel that I have a sense in my head of where they were coming from. Um, I think they were essentially not ready to be parents. I think they were, because I mean, I mean she, she, she was a model, so she must have been pretty fucking young. Um, right, he, right. I've never necessarily specified what, you know, what the dynamic between Hugo Dallancourt and... Um, and Paris's mother was. Um, I briefly forgot what Paris's mother was called. I'm so sorry. It's a, it's a book I wrote a while ago. Um, I'll, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Yeah. Isabella Holloway. Isabella Holloway. Yep. There it goes. Yes, Isabella that's Holloway. One. That's one. Um, like what their what the internal dynamics of that relationship were like, but they they had very high pressure, prestigious careers to do. They had a kid they maybe shouldn't have had. They did their best with him up to a point. I think one of the, um, the other thing I would say is that um, a little while ago, I was, um, uh, I, I think I've mentioned occasionally, I'm a big fan of a YouTuber called Jay Nicholson. And mm -hmm. I listened to one of her videos and she was talking about, I think um, uh, it might have been the Vampire video I was really listening to. And she was talking about how, um, how there's a bit where someone gets sent to boarding school and how like you've got to remember that to an american audience like sending someone to boarding school is this like it's like a thing from 50s movies where the evil stepmom does it as a punishment whereas in the uk it's much more particularly in the uk amongst that social class it's such a right. standard thing that i think it's I think it's a much less evil thing to do. I still think they're um uh the YouTuber I was talking about was Jane Nicholson, yes, thank you. Um uh, th so I think it might land slightly differently, but also but also, yeah, like they're they are not good parents. They are bad parents. Um I I think the hardest thing for me now that I'm thinking about it in this conversation, and thanks to everybody who's chiming in on the chat. I think what made it so much harder for me was that he was so alone. Mm -hmm. Like Oliver has his friends and Oliver has Luke yeah. and, and, and Luke has Odile, Odile, best parent you've ever written in my opinion. <laughs> um, and, and, and all of his friends, but Paris, I, it makes me weepy. Paris had no one. Yeah. He's very lonely. And, but, and it just, and I know, and I, I, I get yeah. it. I know he's a character. I know he's not real. I understand all of those <laughs> well, things. No, but loneliness is something that resonates with people. And oh, like but it. when he, but like when he would throw those texts out into the ether and nothing ever, yeah, absolutely. Morag, Morag yeah. was amazing. But, but, but Morag and Paris for part of the book Are kind of on had the a outs. very fractious situation because they were both trying to wrestle with paris's mental health yeah no and, that's, and i just complex. that was the thing is that loneliness yeah and him. i think and, um, the flip side of that is that of course like at the start of the book paris is that is at university he wouldn't be living with his parents anyway he'd probably be like again i don't want to make excuses for the fictional absent parents because they were very very bad at being parents but 
he would probably have had at least some element of that loneliness anyway. Like it's it's a it's a genuine. It's I, I call again calling my own books complex makes me feel like a complete wanker, but I feel there is an element of complexity to it. Um, there no, there absolutely is, and that's the beauty. Okay, that that lets me give you another compliment. That is the beauty of your books and your characters and the situations you create is they are layered and they are nuanced. You have nuance everywhere. Oh, thank you. And it's so important. But I just like my God, those te- I just oh yeah. It's, 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 I mean, it's 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 deliberately supposed to be kind of heartbreaking. exactly. I can never imagine ignore and and again, I'm not yeah. saying that I'm the best mother. I I have certainly made my share of messes. Um, but that just hit me in so many different places. Yeah. So yeah, sure. well done. So well done you. Thank you. Um, and I, again, I, you know, you gotta love it. Anytime you throw a former, uh, I'm switching again to something a little lighter, but like Elaine, <laughs> Alan, Elaine, whatever we want to call him showing up on that aftermath show. <laughs> that was just a thing of beauty. Yeah. It was absolutely a thing of beauty. Yeah, I will admit to I will admit to thinking to myself, okay, who would the least want to see again? <laughs> and there's, and there's also um, oh sorry, let me cut you off. There's, no, I no, there's, you go. Um, so for what it's worth, just again, I don't like to interpret my own books for people. Um, but part of the reason he's on there is a mild troll. But um, part of it is that a theme of the book is that there's we talk about the social media stuff at the beginning, and um part of what i wanted to bring across was the like radical difference in perception between what people think they see when they're watching the show and what's actually happening on the show like it's very like there's a running theme through the show where just everyone loves Catherine parr because they edit out all the bits where she's awful and racist and so she just comes across as this lovable grandma like every other lovable grandma on the show um like Alan's a slightly difficult, different one in that regard in that it's sort of implied he wasn't very popular on the show anyway. And he does, as, as um, commenters have said, get kind of shot down by the comedian. Um, but it's cl- clearly people do not know half the shit that went on with Alan. Like there's the bit in um, the scene where Paris and Tariq have the confrontation with Jennifer where clearly they don't have the same perception of what went on between harry roslin and alan the readers who read the book have yes yes absolutely um so speaking of that because we talked about that alan thing uh julie would like to know will future books and bake expectations like okay so will the next book Mm -hmm. audrey's book will we get to see paris and Tarek at all I don't know, actually. Please, um, it, please, I, like, I, please. I, I think Just... doing cameos is nice. I don't think it's currently planned to go into the bit of the time. because. So the reason there's a cameo from Alan is because Paris goes on the after show that is filmed when the show is being broadcast. And I think probably um, uh, ALSTP, I'll stop. Um, is not going to go that far into the timeline. I, I might, I might try and work in a cameo from one of them somewhere. Just let, just let Audrey watch an episode of Fabulous Halal. <laughs> I was going to say I might have Fabulous Halal on. Thank there. you, please. Um, Come on, please. That's all I need. That yeah. and nail, I, that and a comment on his nail varnish, and I will be fine. <laughs> um. Jen wants to know, have you heard anything on the film front for Rosalind Palmer? Uh, no, not at all. Um, uh, like, as always, I, I don't trace these things up. Um, right. there's, there's people who work for people who work for people who occasionally communicate with me. And again, what they say is we are giving you a non-trivial but not enormous amount of money for the right to not do anything with this. Um, and that's uh, yeah, so is it going to be a movie? Almost certainly not, but technically some people are talking to some other people about um, about doing a, a, a film adaptation of Frozen Palmer Takes the Cake, um, but I haven't heard from anyone in a long time. So I, I always assume these things aren't happening because that is the only way to stay stable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's a question from Stephanie. Uh, wanting to know if you use, did you use a sense of, 
activity reader for Paris's book. Um, and how does that affect your writing process? Uh, so actually, so it's an interesting one. Um, so I, I did very specifically uh, get a sense of reader for uh, Paris because um, because Tariq's religion is kind of really important to him. I wanted to make sure there was nothing in there that would come across as grossly inauthentic or othering or alienating to Muslims, particularly queer Muslims. Um, it didn't huge. I don't think it hugely. I, I didn't affect my writing process too much. That sounds really negative. It's like I didn't listen to them. Um, I mean more. Um, but I have a very, I have a very ambivalent relationship with sensitivity readers because I, I think it's really important to use them, in a focused, intelligent way. Like um, you don't want to just hire someone to read your book and sort of just run it past what Twitter will say. Like you need to say very specifically, I want you to read this book for this specific thing using your experience as that thing. Uh, so that thing sounds really, that, God, that sounds really othering. I'm so sorry. Um, but as, as you know, someone who is directly affected by these issues, but I think you also have to keep clear in your head that like it's, it's one fucking person. Like, um, like in the difference, there's, um, there's a Richard Dawkins quote about how the difference between an atheist and a monotheist is that an atheist denies the existence of all gods and a monotheist denies the existence of all gods but one. Um, and like there is an extent to which like the difference between having had one person read through the book from that perspective to say, is there anything that, like it's, it's, I think you've got to recognize that what's, what, a, what you should expect a sensitivity reader to catch is is there something here that just genuinely stands out as like, no, this is just freaking wrong. Like, you know, like, like you've got the plural of hadith wrong or you've mispronounced it again. I'm terribly sorry, my pronunciations of a lot of things are bad because I'm an ignorant white person. Um, it's not about making, like, I think very often sensitivity readers, sensitivity readers are like, they become the... Um, they become the what's the word the the, the literary equivalent of, of 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 your ex friend you know it's like I got some sensitivity reader, it's and that's not what you want so it's um when I say having a sensitivity reader didn't impact my writing process I think what I mean is I did not rely on the sensitivity reader as the only thing like you know I had you know I made some efforts to you know read biographies by queer Muslims. I made some efforts to like uh, check out blogs by queer Muslims and um, generally get a sense of a, you know, a range of particular, particularly in terms of like um, of how people reconcile that particular faith with the, that particular identity. And funnily enough, the answer is in lots of different ways because yeah, queer Muslims aren't a monolith, queer people aren't a monolith, Muslims aren't a monolith. I mean, you know, Islam is explicitly not monolithic. It's not got a centralized like hierarchy like catholicism it's um so yeah i i did have one because i thought it was important i sometimes do but it's it was very clear to me that that one job was the like the whoa how did you not catch this stuff and not well it must be all right because one person read it and said it wasn't offensive because you know there will be people that i'm sure there are people who it won't speak to people who are alienated by it that is a a complex reality of writing books about people with a range of identities um whether those identities are entities that you you know have a part of or not as it were um right right so i'm i'm reminded of a line from i believe it's boyfriend material when odile is talking about drag race and luke desperately wants to say to her something like it exists on a spectrum. Yeah. And I think listening to you just now talk about and, and listening to you talk in all of our conversations, that is kind of, that's like, that's it, right? I mean, I don't yeah, want to sum much. up everything, but it exists on a spectrum. There yeah, is nuance no, exactly. in life. Yeah, Boom. No, exactly. um, not, yeah, not everything is for everybody. Not everything yeah. speaks to everybody or speaks for everybody. Yeah. No, and I would never want to speak. I, I, yeah, I would never want to speak for anyone that doesn't feel spoken for by me because that it, would be gross. Exactly. Um, yeah. I will tell you and remind you that in the in the 
pre-submitted questions, many people were very grateful to your handling of it and that you provided that Tarek was a character who was both queer and very devoted mm-hmm. no, again, well, to that was his very faith. To me. And that was, uh, that was a lovely reflection. So well done you. Oh, thank you. Um, I am going to wrap this soon because I have, it is nighttime where Alexis is. I, um, genuinely, it's fine. I have terrible sleep patterns anyway. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm so sure I'm you've trying... also got your own things to do. <laughs> no, no, no. I got... My family's at the Renaissance Fair. I'm fine. Um, I'm looking through some other questions. Where was one that I saw that I really liked? It was from someone named Catherine. Do you think, or what other characters from the Alexis Hall universe would go on bake expectations? She thinks that Oliver would serve up some great um, vegan bakes. Like if he was on like alternative ingredient week, he would completely. Yeah, slay. Oliver would be good and he would smash alternative ingredient week. Um, I'm trying to think if like, I feel like, I feel like Oliver would be one of those contestants who would do really well, but then he'd just like have one colossal fuck up and go out for some reason yeah. right? on something that, like, yeah, and it'd be like kind of something he'd like. Like ca- Caramel Week or something. Yeah, like, yeah, something like that. Um, <laughs> obviously, obviously, like Luke, we know can't cook at all. Um, Claire said, what if Odile goes on? <laughs> I mean, Odile, Odile would be on. I mean, so obviously Odile wouldn't make the cut, but if they like some, you know, actually, Odile. Oh no, gosh, Odile could be on Celebrity, couldn't she? She could. Oh my Literally god, can you imagine her on Celebrity? Oh my god, that'd be great. Harry James Acaster. Um, that would be. Oh my god. Yeah. No. I mean, mm-hmm. and I, I, I don't think they get eliminated on Celebrity either. So no, like, you don't. You just, There's just four. No, you just do it and you cook and someone gets named yeah. Star Baker. Like, I just watched yeah. the one last night. It's the holiday one, but it's the cast of It's a Sin. It was hilarious. And some of them were very capable and some of them were like, I got nothing. Here we go. Yeah. No, I think that I think that's where she'd be. Um, oh, my God. That is. Yes. The dear Car- Callie, the Dairy Girls one. I love to. OK, someone. Yeah. So we got all kinds of suggestions there. Um, Isaac is saying uh, he appreciates that um, it is inspiring that he has never seen an image of you. It gives him hope for someone who doesn't like social media and doesn't like appearing publicly, but does want to work creatively. So oh, fantastic. thanks for Thank that you. inspiration. Uh, let me see what else I'm getting. Anybody else have any spoiler questions? You can throw them into the chat or you can throw them into the Q&A. I am trying to remember what other spoiler I had, but I have so many windows open on my screen right now. It is hard to find it. Um, oh, you know, I really like joy. I really like the practical nature of the relationship she and Paris had. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I just, not that that is how everybody or everyone approaches a mental health um working with mental health but i i just i really enjoyed that and then how she showed up and i know it was because they were all in the group because they were all on reality tv yeah. um but like she showed up with him backstage before he went on yeah no it's a, a, one of the things that um is the most difficult with characters like that she's only in like two scenes right um, but I've had some really positive. Um, uh, yeah, I think she's um like I think the the thing with Joy is that she's definitely supposed to be on like a countdown like show. Um, I don't think I've watched that particular version of Countdown, but I'm uh, sorry, so I'm, I'm sorry, I just replied to a comment which is no, it's all good. Really unhelpful. No, it's not. You're you're engaging with people, and that's a fine thing to do. Um, Kelly does say, um. <laughs> Her job involves helping staff manage their workloads, and she um, is a little nervous for you with the insane number of books that you released this year and that you're releasing next year. I mean, much as it makes me sad, I do want to fully support your work habits and whatever you need to move successfully through life. But is it, do you think it will taper off? Uh, My intent is to reach taper off, yes. Basically, as I think I've said a couple of times, the way it works is that, the way it works, the way it worked is that I had an uptick in my public profile. And so I went from submit 10 books, get nine rejections, to submit 10 books, get six rejections. And that suddenly meant I had four times as many books coming out as usual. Um, 
and I was very much, you know, like this could go away at any second, can't say no to anything. And as a result, I wound up getting a lot of getting a lot of opportunities and taking a lot of opportunities. And uh, that's been really good. It's been really positive in a lot of ways. But it does mean I've wound up doing four books this year and that. Yeah, so it's four books this year, three books in a re-release next year. I think it might be two to three. Obviously, there's there's the Spires re-releases that are going to be trickling out, but they are less there's less new new writing to do with those obviously right, right. um okay and after that i think i think like probably in the region of two books a year is about sustainable for me maybe two in a bit depends on where it falls okay i will allow that um <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, Alisa, speaking of pre- of upcoming work, is the Amber Glass B story still on the horizon? I believe so. Yes, I mean, it's it's um it's on the horizon, but in a kind of again, I've got three books coming out next year. I'm like that. It's definitely not 2023. I would need to double check my list. I had I had a whiteboard that had all my release dates written on it, and it fell off the wall. Um, because I, I, I did that thing where I was like, oh, I'll get a really nice one. So I got a really nice one with like a glass front and that made it heavy. Um, and yeah. that didn't work. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I just rely on my agent and, um, and occasionally having to like dig through old emails. I was like, crap, that's due. Um, <laughs> it'll, it'll all come together. Uh, it is so bad, yes. Yes, it absolutely will. Um, a couple shout outs for the bonus scene of Gordon Ramsay and Bernard. <laughs> I am worried Gordon Ramsay would see me. Maybe he could name be named Rorden Gamsey. <laughs> He's specifically called Gordon Ramsay in the book. Though, so I know, but difficult. if you did a bonus scene, it could be with Rorden Gamsey. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> that is amazing. It'll go on the list. I am so so incredibly grateful for this time with you i am so Thank incredibly so grateful for your work um it just thank you for balancing everything because what you do brings a great deal of joy to a great many people thank you i just i love that it's afternoon in houston it's evening where alexis is and it's tomorrow in australia where we mm-hmm. have a number of people watching um it's 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 just so much fun. So um we will see you again on January, I want to say 19th. You can check the Blue Willow schedule for that. Um I am very excited to see what the special things for Glitterland look like. <laughs> I am hopeful that it will continue to be a bit chilly here in Houston so I can make Nanny Dot's cottage pie with cheddar. Oh, um I and chilly by Houston standards must be actually fairly warm, mustn't it? It, it yeah. I mean, it's it's seven here today. It is yeah. chilly for okay, us. That's actually fairly chilly, to be fair. That's centigrade or Fahrenheit. Yeah, it is. That is centigrade. I, oh. I translated it for you. No, I was going to say, look at your code switching. Yeah, it's forty-five for us. Um, but everybody, thank you for being here again. We're happy to be Alexis's store. We have adorable book plates. Many themed for the books, but also if you order any of his backlist, we have a book plate, book plate from Alexis uh, that we will throw right in there for you. So I think that's it for me again. Such a joy, friend. Such, such, such a joy. Thank I, you so much. It's I'm always grateful. lovely to be here. It's very, very fun. Mary and Caroline in the background, I'm very grateful to you too. Thank you all so much. Uh, be well wherever you are, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Take care, y'all. Goodbye.